Good morning, church. I appreciate and covet your prayers, especially right now. So, um, last minute stuff. So excited, so blessed by the Lord and all that he has done here. Um, just one add-on to the ladies' prayer meeting. If, ladies, if you're coming this Tuesday, um, you can use the new entrance out back. You'll be meeting out back. Um, I know Nicole mentioned it during announcements, but thank you for your patience with our construction and all that. I'll try to get 20 or 30 HEPA filters in here this week and clear up the dust and all of that too. But it's, uh, it's amazing what God has done back there and what's going to happen. Actually, I was going to say out there, but in here too. There'll be new flooring in here. And once this is finished, that'll give us probably 40 more seats. So um, invite your friends. But we're going to be in Acts chapter 22. Now let's pray together, please. Father, we are just amazed and in awe of you. Lord, as we see, um, not to minimize, but the small stuff that you're doing with the building and expansion and all that. And Lord, it may, it certainly doesn't seem small to us, but when I look out and I see the transformation in lives, Lord, the, the big changes that you're making here in us and in your people, it just I stand in awe of you and thank you for it, Lord. And Lord, we've gathered here today because we desperately need to hear from you. Uh, learn from the examples in your word, but Lord, in ways that will impact and change our lives today. And, and to put ourselves in a position to be usable for your kingdom, Lord, and change the lives of our families and communities and, and all of that. So we thank you, Lord, for this place, but we thank you for transitioning in our lives and that you, you desire bigger things for us than we could ever imagine. So Lord, be merciful today and, and speak, we pray, um, through your word. Let all the distractions and things that are running through our heads just be set aside as we trust you, Lord in this time. Please bless the uh, men and ladies serving out back there today for this little bit of extended time. Um, we're just grateful. Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. So Acts chapter 22 is where we pick up this morning. I didn't have time to change my slides, so we'll hit a couple verses in 21 so that doesn't look like a mistake. Actually, that's a good point. Um, to set the scene of where we are in the scriptures today. Um, most of you guys, as I look out, I think you were here last Sunday, but those that weren't or those that are, are joining us online, if that's working today. Um, a couple of things we talked about, a couple primary people we talked about last week was a guy named Philip, who was one of the early deacons. And, and you see this scene where... He saw one of his best friends or, or one of these guys that he was serving with, I assume because of the relationships that we've witnessed here, serving alongside one another, how tight that is. He saw Stephen be killed. And a guy that consented to that death, which we'll read about today and was present, was Saul of Tarsus. And then Saul has this incredible encounter with Jesus that radically changes his life. And then we see 20 years later, Philip is inviting him into his home to spend the night. And uh, just the example of forgiveness, the, the transition of this guy named Saul of Tarsus to Paul the Apostle. And then Paul gets taken into custody. He begins to speak, or he tries to speak to this crowd of Jews, and they actually beat him. And, and it sounds like they were trying to beat him to death. And we talked about how we might receive that or how we might respond to that. If, if the persecution was so great that we were being dragged and we were being beaten for sharing our faith. And then we see Paul say to, his, say to the leader, hey, can I talk to you for just a second? Any chance I could address this crowd? And what most of us would have seen as 
a terrible tragedy and uh, unjust torture, really, he saw as the opportunity of a lifetime, a chance to speak. And it's just the heart of these two men. This is really one of my favorite passages in the scriptures, Acts chapter 21 and then 22. And it's been modeled here. Thank you, by the way, everyone that's shown up and participated in this. I think we had all of our deacons uh, present yesterday helping Donna uh, move, which was incredible. And uh, not to point anyone out and let their head explode, but Hunter has been a rock star here. He uh, finally, last night, I had to say, dude, I got to go home. You're killing me. He, he just kept saying, what would it take to get this done, too? You know, wouldn't it be a blessing to have that done? So the TV out in the lobby, um, I won't share that whole story, but there's a 100-foot cable from there to there that goes through a non-fat man-friendly attic, um, 16 inches on center. I'm 16, pretty much, like that, if I exhale. He did all that. We got it hooked up. TV recognized that there was a feed, no sound, no picture. And then on the end of this little cable, they say which way to run that wire. So it was all pulled back out <laughs> and run again. So, and, and I was, I, I, we'll get to the scriptures. But I told him, I've seen people mess up, including myself, when I ran these like three years ago or whatever, doing that same thing. And his heart and attitude when it was done was not to rail off a bunch of expletives or just complain. It was just, well, I guess we need to rerun that. And just a willingness to do it and jump in. It was a young man witness to me yesterday. So thank you, Hunter, for all that you've done. Um, thinking about it this morning, eight years ago, a lot of you guys were here with us as we tore up carpets out there and... Um, did all that. And, and really, as we get into this scene of Paul, so he's taken into custody and he asks, can I have this opportunity to speak? And, and most commentators, and I think the last time that I taught through this passage, really kind of analyzed this message that Paul gave. But I don't want to miss kind of the big picture of what Paul's doing. Paul's really just telling his story, giving his testimony in this section. And when you look around us at this building, this building has a testimony. You know, it was built like 50 years ago. And it's been several different things. It, it was built as a VFW, and there's a lot of amazing things that happened when this was a VFW. Some of you guys were married in here uh, or had your wedding receptions here. And there was good things and there was bad things as, as time went on and the building decla decayed and different things. And then it was a, a time of rebirth when the Lord provided the opportunity for us to get this building. And eight years ago, we were super excited about um, transition that was happening and growth that was happening and change that was happening in this building and then giving us an opportunity to meet. And as we look around now, you know, last week I said, did you notice anything different? What you can't see on the camera is these big plastic drapes hanging down over here and stuff piled up on that side of the room. And um, did we zoom our camera back? Yeah, well, I don't know. just hit one on that thing. And uh, out back, did anybody peek out here today? All the panelings ripped off the walls and it, it's a work in progress. You know, and, and as I see what Paul did here, that's what he's saying. You know, this is what I was. This is who I was before Jesus. And then I had this incredible encounter with Jesus, and it changed my life in this way, and here's the reason for it. And as I look around, we all have a testimony, like Paul. We all have a story. You know, believers that are here this morning, or believers that are listening online, we had a life pre-Jesus. And then... We had an encounter that radically changed the rest of our lives. And, and here's why, and here's the difference that it made in our life. And I think that's kind of the big picture of what we see with Paul in this section. So again, the scene is he's in custody. He's been beaten. And really, the rest of the book of Acts, Paul remains in custody. But he has an opportunity. He says, can, can I just speak to this crowd? Can I take the opportunity to do this? Now, what's interesting to me also, if you look at the pattern in the book of Acts, up until this point, I would expect Paul to now, 
go line upon line, verse by verse, and go through all of the Old Testament scriptures, because he's speaking to this Jewish crowd, right? And, and go through all of it, go through Isaiah, go through Daniel, and everything that points to the coming Messiah as Jesus, that he would share with these guys, because that's the pattern, right? He'd, he'd go into the synagogues, and, and he would see where they're at, and he, the, the scripture says multiple times that he reasoned with them, that he found out where they were coming from, and then he went through the scriptures and he gave them good reason to believe that they needed to be saved and that the Savior was Jesus Christ. This is a little bit different. He goes through, and, and like I said, that's, that's what I would be expecting, but he says, hey, I'm standing before you now that I'm speaking, I was just being dragged and beaten, but I get it. I understand exactly where you guys were, are. I understand all the feelings that you've got inside and the hesitation and, and really the hate and rage that seems to be going on here because you're judging, then I'm judging you. Kind of, I'm, I'm looking at you and saying, you guys don't get it and you're not enough. And, and you need to be more like me. And he's saying, this is not in any way me doing this. You're not even contending with Paul the Apostle. You're contending with the Lord. And he starts out in the first verse saying, this is my defense. But it, and, and that's the defense. Is not only was I one of you, I was you times ten. So I get it. And, and God has set this whole thing up. And God has brought me here to talk to you. So... Again, just to set the scene, going back to Acts 21 at the very end, it says, now as they were seeking to kill him, so not a good reception, right? News came to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains. And he asked who he was and what he had done. And some among the multitude cried one thing and some another. So when he could not ascertain the truth because of the tumult, So he's trying to question Paul and say, what's going on? Why, why in the world is this crowd in such an uproar and, and trying to kill you, as the scripture says? But he can't even ascertain an answer because it's, it's chaos. He commanded him to be taken into the barracks so he could just hear, so he could talk to him. When he reached the stairs, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. Okay, so this is the scene. For the multitude of the people followed after, crying out, away with him. Then as Paul was about to be led into the barracks, he said to the commander, may I speak to you? He replied, can you speak Greek? Shocked that this guy not just could speak Greek, but educated Greek. How in the world could somebody that they're trying to beat and kill be among the elite? And he said, aren't you, it sounds like a, a case of mistaken identity here. Aren't you the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a rebellion and led the 4,000 assassins out of the wilderness? But Paul said, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Sicilia, a citizen of no mean city, and I implore you, permit me to speak to the people. So when he had given him permission, Paul stood on the stairs and motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great silence, he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, saying, and that's where we left off last week. So there's something about this guy. This crowd is whipped into a frenzy, ready to kill him. He stands up there, lifts his hand, and they become silent to listen. And then he starts. Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. And when they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. Then he said, verse 3, I am indeed a Jew, born in Tarsus of Sicilia, but, I brought, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamiel, or something like that. Um, exactly what Milton said. Which would have been a rare privilege. This was the um, most notable rabbi at the time kind of an elite class. Very few people would have had this opportunity. And Paul's saying, I was taught according to the strictness of our Father's law and was zealous towards God as you all are today. So he's looking out this crowd that's ready to beat and kill him. And he's like, what can I find good? What can I, what can I say good? You know what? You guys are zealous towards God. Good job, like me. I persecuted this way. So speaking of the, the church, speaking of Christians, I was right there with you. I persecuted this way to the death, 
binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. I was like you, but worse. Non-discriminatory. Verse 5 says, As also the high priest bears me witness. You guys can talk to the, the high priest. You can talk to the religious leaders. All the council of the elders from whom I also received letters to the brethren. And I went to Damascus to bring in chains, even those who were there, to Jerusalem to be punished. So all of this zeal, all of this, this um, attacking and persecution that I did, I did it with the authority and blessing of the religious leaders. So I understand where you're at. But then he says, here's my defense. And again, he lays out who he was before he personally had a relationship with Jesus. And says, I persecuted to the death. I went, I went a step further than you guys have even done here today. But I get what's going on with you. Verse 6 says, Now it happened as I journeyed, and I came near Damascus at about noon. Suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid, but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. So I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Arise and go into Damascus, and there you will be told all things which you are appointed for you to do. And since I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came into Damascus. Then a certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me and stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that same hour, I looked up at him. Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you, that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling out on the name of the Lord. So Paul's saying, guys, this is who I was. And I'm no longer that person. And if you hear what he's doing, if you look at the message, he is in a... He, subtly, he's saying, here's what you need to do. He, um, that I had this encounter with Jesus, and Jesus is the Messiah. This crowd is not in the place where they're receiving these subtleties. But he's also speaking of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because this crowd, this is like 20 years after Paul gets saved, has this encounter on the road, and he's saying, yes, Jesus came as the Messiah. Jesus died on the cross and spilt his blood, but I had this encounter with him afterwards, and, and, and I have an ongoing relationship with him. So he has been resurrected, and he's living today, is, is all part of this message. So um, we're going to see the response here in a minute. There ends up being a riot, but Verse 17, now it happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I was in a trance. Verse 18, and I saw, and saw him saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. So I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believe on you. So interesting to me, he's preaching to this group of Jews and, and he's declaring Jesus to be the Messiah that they've missed. And we don't have a riot yet. They're not flipping out yet. They're still listening. They're still hearing this. But then we get to this point and, and Paul's saying, so let me back up. I had this encounter with Jesus, this, this second scene. And he says, make haste quickly and get out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. And then Paul says, so I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believe on you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then he said to me, depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. So Paul, in a sense, is describing a debate or an argument or a disagreement that he's having with God with Jesus, right? He, Jesus says, you need to flee from here. They're going to take you out. 
They're going to destroy you, Paul. You need, to, you need to move on. And Paul says, hey, wait a minute, God. You're, you're pulling the wrong guy out of Jerusalem. I'm right where these guys were at. In fact, I went in and persecuted. And how many of you guys have learned that any time that we're arguing with God, you're wrong? Can I raise both hands? Hallelujah. Yeah, any time we are in that debate, and I, I think a lot of us have been there, God, through his Holy Spirit or through his word, will reveal something to us, and we dig in our heels, or we don't understand, or we're resistant, and we start giving God all the reasons why he's wrong. That ought to ring a bell. Anytime we're in disagreement with God, we are the ones that are wrong. And it's time, rather than to continue the debate, to ask him why we're wrong, how we're wrong. Show us, Lord. Pretty arrogant spot to be in when we argue with our Creator. You know, that's, and, and Paul admittedly here is saying, this was the deal. God, you're pulling the wrong guy out of Jerusalem. I, I've been where these people are. They get me, or, and I get them. It, who better than me to be the one trying to share the gospel with them? Let's see the result. Verse 22, and they listened to him until this word. What word? Back up just a second. Depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. As soon as the Jews heard, not just the part about the Messiah, but that God commissioned them to go share the good news, share the, the message of the gospel to the Gentiles, that's when they flipped out. Who was the Gentile in the mind of the Jews? Any non-Jew. right? Anybody but us is unworthy. I mean, really, the, the, the phrases that they used were that they were Gentile dogs. You know, and, and when you read some of the old writings, that they were described, the, the God's purpose for the Gentiles were fodder for the fires of hell, just like fire logs to keep the fires burning and hot. That was the purpose. That was their heart towards them. So when they heard that God said, depart from here, I'm going to send you to, to save the Gentiles, they listened to him until they heard that word, verse 22. And then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth. Annihilate him. For he is not fit to live. Then as they cried out and tore off their clothes and threw dust into the air, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks and said that he should be examined under the scourging so that he might know why they shouted so against him. So we're going to torture you a little more. He's saying, so we'll figure out what's going on. Verse 25, and then as they bound him with thongs, not what you're thinking, today's thongs. Never mind, sorry. Leather straps, tied him up. Paul said to the centurion, a, a, a guard that would have overseen a hundred other soldiers who stood by, it is lawful for you to scourge, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? Rome was the powerhouse of the world at the time. So, they had rights and privileges that no other citizen, Jew or Gentile, none of that stuff mattered. It mattered if you were Roman. And he's saying he, he's in this position where they're getting ready to take him into custody and beat him with these whips, with stones and rocks and all this stuff in there. And he said, hold on, guys, let me ask you a question. Because you couldn't even bind a Roman citizen, much less scourge him. So let me ask you a question. Is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned. And panic sets in. When the centurion heard that, verse 26, he went and told the commander, saying, Take care what you do. Be careful here, for this man is a Roman. Then the commander came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman? And in the se severity of the punishment, kind of uh, similar today, unearned valor. When somebody claims to have been a soldier or a veteran and they didn't earn that, um, how society looks on them, multiply that by 10. People wouldn't falsely claim to be a, a Roman citizen because it could be proven out and then the punishment was so severe. So he asked him, tell me, are you a Roman? And he says, yes. Verse 28, the commander answered, with such a large sum, I obtained citizenship as well. I had to buy my way into that. And the implication is how in the world could you? have done that. But Paul says, I was born a Roman citizen, either through my mother or through my father, gained favor, had citizenship, and I was granted that through them. 
Then immediately those who were about to examine him withdrew from him, and the commander was also afraid after he found out that he was a Roman and because he had bound him. The next day, because he wanted to know for certain why he was accused by the Jews, he released him from his bonds and commanded the chief priests and all their council to appear and brought Paul down and set him before them. And, and we'll get to that next week. There's another opportunity that he has to share and speak. But I, we're not done. Hold on. That would be like a record. We're close, though. I, I just want you to hear this. Every time we've seen Paul in the book of Acts up until now, and he's had opportunity to teach and share, he's gone through and he's reasoned with them. And here, when he has this opportunity to speak this crowd, he shares his testimony. He tells his story. And inspired by the Holy Spirit, that was deemed the most powerful thing that Paul could do to reach the Jews. And we'll see in a later chapter, he does the same thing, repeats a lot of this, as he has the opportunity to witness to the Gentiles. Everything around us, guys, looking at this place, this building is a story of redemption. You guys are a story of redemption, and your story is unique from mine. Very different in some ways. Very similar in others. But we all have this opportunity to say, Hey, here, this is where I was at without Jesus. And, and, and for some of us, it's this, this big story of addiction and destruction and all of that. And some of it, for some of us, is just hopelessness. No peace. No salvation. And then there was this encounter. And Jesus changed everything. And here's what life is like now. And I'm sharing this with you because Jesus changed everything for me. And I care about you. And I can relate to where you were at because I was once there. And it is so easy. This was Paul, remember guys, 20 years after this encounter with Jesus. And he has this opportunity. He's like, I got to tell you where I was at. And I got to tell you the difference Jesus made in my life. He's, he's never forgotten that transition. And I don't, I don't know how, when the last time you thought about your testimony, your story. And you know, we've encouraged you at different times to like, think about it, write it down, refine it. Not just so we don't um, give too many details that aren't necessary or leave things out. You know, we should all be willing and ready to give reason for the hope that's within us. And just that simple pattern that we see Paul give here of here's who I was without Jesus. Here's the encounter that I had with Jesus. He details that in here. And here's the difference that it made in my life. And I was reminded of a dramatic example of that. You guys remember the, the demoniac screaming and actually the, the community put him out of town and bound him with chains, and he would cut himself and all that. That, that. Then he had this encounter with Jesus. And after that, he gets saved, and he wants to go with Jesus and be with Jesus and, and just be in ministry and travel with him. And do you remember Jesus' response? Um, let me see. Luke. Luke chapter 8. There's a couple different... Um, mentions in the different gospels. But it says, Now the man whom the demons had departed begged him that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away. So this guy, here's who I was before Jesus. I used to cut myself and scream and terrify everybody by the life that I was living. And I had this encounter with Jesus. He saved me. And he just wants to be with Jesus and be released and freed from all that. And Jesus' response amazes me. Jesus sent him away. Luke chapter 8, verse 39, saying, Return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. And he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. 
This is who I was. I met Jesus. And I got to tell you the great things he has done. How he's changed me. And rather than Jesus take him on the road, he said, go right back to the people that know you and saw you in that state. And live in such a way that they can see this transition that you're going to tell them about. That Jesus has made a, a daily difference in your life. And now you have the hope of heaven. And you have salvation. And Jesus didn't look at this guy and say, you know what? You were just filled with a demon. So we're going to watch you for 30 or 40 years. Or you got to go through this school or that school or any of that. He said, go share this good news, how I've changed your life. Right? Return to your own house. Tell what great things God has done for you. And then he did it. That's my challenge and my encouragement to each of you this week. Return to your own house. Return to your place of work. Return to your school. And tell what great things God has done. Who you were. The difference that it made. And why in your life. Let's pray. Father, I'm so grateful for this reminder from Paul. Lord, Paul, who knew the scriptures inside and out, and, and that is important, and you've instructed us to do that, to, to gather together and teach through the word that we would know you more. But this reminder, Lord, it's not just about how smart we can get or how much we can learn, but that we are living stones, living examples, living testimonies, and each one has one that's unique, and you've got us here breathing air and doing what we do, Lord, because your desire is to use us uniquely in the lives around us. So, Lord, thank you for this reminder and encouragement. And, Lord, give us the strength and the boldness this week to have faith in you where, where maybe we lack confidence in ourselves and do what you've instructed here, that we would return to the place that you've placed us, Lord, and tell the great things you've done in our life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys.